Well, thank you, Aaron and Jordan, for joining us. Um, Aaron and Jordan Candell have written screenplays for Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, and Disney. And you've probably seen their work with the movie Moana and also the survival film Adrift, which they also produced. And uh, as you might suspect, when you see, see them together, they are twin brothers following directly in the footsteps of Julius and Philip Epstein, the identical twin brothers who wrote the, uh, the, another movie you may have heard of, Casablanca. And as it turns out, Aaron and Jordan and I, we, we grew up together. And so I got to see firsthand your early obsession with stories and storytelling. And as long as I can remember, you were always reading and talking about one story or another. And what's more, had a wide variety of novel, uh, of fantasy novel figurines in your room at any given point. And uh, most of our audience today is currently in middle or high school. And could you take us on the arc of your path from that age to your current um, career as screenwriters? Yeah, for sure. And Dr. Derricks saw us at our most nerdiest uh, at the same age that most of you kids are, uh, where we not only had fantasy figurines, which we still have and our kids now play with, uh, we also had every Christmas and birthday, our parents would get us like a new sword to add to our growing and insane sword collection that we would take out onto the sea cliffs in Hawaii and pretend that we were like King Arthurian knights. Uh, <laughs> And fortunately, we didn't hack any of our or our friends' limbs off. So we're all here <laughs> home. <laughs> and yeah, the arc, I'd say, is, uh, you know, there's long-winded answers to all of these, but the arc pretty much hasn't changed since those days. It, it's We do the same thing. We just do it on paper now, right? The pen is mightier than the sword. We, we've changed instruments. So all those fantasy worlds and those battles that we had and our imagination with our play uh, weaponry, we just bring to life in imaginary worlds uh, that we write. And it's just went from being readers, just nonstop avid readers to uh, starting to write that and never stopping. So now we just do both, we read and we write. Well, I remember in middle school and high school, you were very passionate writers. Um, I remember actually reading some of your short stories and because uh, you're constantly writing them and talking about them, asking for feedback even. And uh, you, you also studied Latin, I think, as well. And that kind of probably also fed into your, your just your general love of language and uh, storytelling. Yeah, the, the only Latin phrase I can remember, because it was the one that our seventh and eighth grade Latin teacher made us repeat over and over is repetitio est mater memoriam, which means repetition is the mother of memory. And that's yeah. pretty much after six years of Latin and minoring in Italian in college and studying abroad in, in Italy, it's pretty much all I can remember of any of that because you don't practice Latin. It's an unspoken dead language. And in, uh, in Hawaii, there's not many uh, Italian speakers to keep my, my dialogue up with. It. So uh, I guess it helped in conjugating verbs, but I don't know about the rest. Well, that's true. So yes, you were very serious in your studies. That's a great thing. And uh, then you went on to, to USC. Tell us about your time at uh, University of Southern California. So USC is considered, it's probably in the top five, 10 film schools in the world, certainly probably the top two or three in the nation up there with like NYU Tisch Film School, which is where our older brother went. Um, and we went to USC and didn't major in screenwriting or film. We actually both majored in poetry um, because we thought we were going to be poets and thought if we could learn to be good poets, we could kind of write anything. Um, so a love of film always existed from when we were young. And it was sort of like parallel to writing prose writing yeah, and poetry mind. with film kind of being in the middle where it's very imagery and visual poetry base so it's sort of a happy medium between just long prose writing and in a novel and, and a poem which is very stripped back you're kind of in this middle place um, and so that's kind of where we started to play around with uh, 
screenwriting classes and screenwriting together um, because poetry is not very collaborative. And we always knew we wanted to work together since we're so close as twins. Great. And then after, after US, well, tell me about USC actually. Did you have any um, writing mentors in USC that you found quite inspirational or very instructive in helping you become better writers and develop your, your craft? Well, too many, if any, writers, creatives, or really people who have succeeded in any field that, they, um, that they're in, who didn't at some point have at least one great teacher, didn't necessarily have to be their academic teacher. It could have been a mentor role. It could have been a coach. It could have been a parent. It could have been an older brother. It could have been someone in, in some form of the community who saw something in them and encouraged them. And we had several of those throughout that we could point to starting with like, you know, our third grade teacher when we both wrote our first uh, short story that was like, go home and write a three page double spaced giant kid block letter. You know, it's probably like a hundred words as a kid. And we came back the next day with like 30 page short stories that were single space because we just got lost in the flow state of that and sort of the first experience and was like, this is amazing. You should keep doing this. We had a sixth grade teacher who brought a poet in uh, who we didn't even know what a poet was as a concept in sixth grade, that there was somebody whose profession could be observing the world and nature in some deep a uh, philosophical kind of way, and then putting that into a poem and they could get paid for it and they could live and have a career. And so that was sort of eye-opening. As juniors in high school, our creative writing teacher was mm -hmm. writing his first book at the time, uh, which came out, I think the year after called Eddie Would Go about Eddie Aikau. And it's sort of a iconic, became an iconic nonfiction biography of one of the greatest uh, Hawaiian heroes and watermen of all time. And so he was incredibly encouraging when we were juniors of our, of our short stories, of our poetry. He'd share early chapters as he was drafting them with us and just made it feel like there was a conversation happening and a dialogue that it wasn't just somebody talking to or at us, but that we were included in some greater narrative of creativity. Uh, kind of in a collaborative way. And so that was exciting. In college, we had several um, great teachers, some of whom our, our first freshman year uh, was one of the like uh, administrators at USC who ran maybe the entire English department or something like that and did a freshman seminar. It was like the one class he'd ever taught called Writing to be Read. And the advice in that class was, that we just gave in a talk, we, we sort of plagiarized because great writers steal uh, this advice for a talk we did this morning to a bunch of other people in the creative community is pick one person, if you're a writer, that, uh, that you're envisioning your story or your poem or whatever your medium you're writing in is as your audience. You write it for not just some abstract, nameless, audience, not just for some fame or fortune or whatever construct or conceit, write it for a very specific person, whoever that is. It could be, you know, your sister, your mother, it could be a teacher, it could be a friend, it could be, this is how Aaron started dating who became his wife as a senior in high school. It could be the girl that you like and Aaron wrote a poem for. That's a very specific intended audience. And 20 years later, He's been married for 20 years and has two kids with this person. So they're right for a specific audience and you will meet greater success. And so that was uh, advice we still live by. So there's been a number of, of teachers in our role that were very uh, influential. Great. And so you graduated USC and uh, I remember visiting you in LA for a moment there uh, afterwards where you were um, I think you finished uni university. And what, what did you get up to right after university? Um, we spent a couple years uh, on and off in LA, just trying to like, you got to be where the sausage is made and all of the like movies are made right. in Hollywood. So we have to be in Hollywood. 
So we spent a lot of the probably two or three years on and off just trying to take meetings and trying to write scripts and chase potential assignments and make relationships. Um, and then when that, we weren't getting a lot of traction doing that and we weren't feeling fulfilled doing that. So we actually moved back to Hawaii and um, were teachers while we were writing. Um, and so, cause we love teaching and, and so we got to kind of recharge our writing with teaching and recharge our teaching with like some of the creative output. And so that was a nice balance. That kept I want to, I want to come back to this, but before this, um, so once you'd finished, you graduated college, you um, apparently had, had decided, yes, we're, we're going to be professional writers. That's what we're going to do. When, when did you actually make that, um, make that decision and, uh, and to it, say, yep, that, I, that's what we're going for. I feel like junior year in college, we had an idea for a screenplay. We were in screenwriting classes and we thought, well, let's try to write this together. And we did over like three weekends and was just like, this clicks, this works, let's do this. And it was a pretty clear, I don't think that happens that often in life, but for us, it was a pretty clear choice. And so e even when we got offers to teach out of college, um, we turned down full-time teaching jobs and would teach in the summer, we would tutor, we would um, uh, substitute teach so that we could be writing full-time. Um, and we taught, you know, we taught full time for a year, but then uh, it was always writing. So we wrote for 10 years, nine, 10 years before we could say that we could support ourselves as professional writers. But we never stopped writing that whole time, whether we were making money or not. It was kind of the same. Uh, it was the same dedication and commitment, the same daily practice, the same insane amount of hours. Uh, just somebody started paying us eventually. And when you say insane hours, this this is something like like literally 10, 13 hours a day you're writing on, on top of pretty much your 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 full time full time gig. Is that right? Yeah, I don't think it was probably uh, uh the most sustainable way to be a creative person. Right. Uh, I think you can do that in non-creative professions, but you'll get tired no matter what you're doing. Like you'll, there'll be a burnout rate for working that many hours just as a human being without balance. But, you know, we were young and in our twenties and, and loved this, loved writing and were committed to just kind of. Uh, well, it's that thing, like when you find what you're passionate about, what you're curious about um, and we never, you know, we know so many people that are much more talented just as as writers uh, off the bat. Like we were never the most talented. We were just the hardest working. And it was that idea of like, oh, I really, I found martial arts. I really love martial arts. I want to be a black belt as quickly as I can. But that means I just have to keep punching these boards and breaking my knuckles over and over until I get to the point where the board breaks and not my knuckles. Uh, and that just required a lot of practice and time and investment and commitment. And so we were like, how do we get better faster? Let's just pour in the time into it. That's very impressive to be so professional about it before you have really any indication, you know, solid indication that you're gonna be successful at this. You're, you're you know, consummate professionals right from the start and have continued that all the way all the way through. But sounds like that's really what it what it takes to, to summit that mountain. Yeah, it, it, it helped too that like, you know, at the same time, my wife uh, is a clinical psychologist and she was going through sort of like the traditional medical school, like version of you have to get your undergrad, then you have to get your master's, then you have to go do your postdoc and your, you know, it's, it, there's like a eight to 10 year track to become a doctor or a lawyer or all of those more stable kind of careers that your parents all want you to do instead of the arts because it's so unstable and we were like seeing her do that was like oh right for her to become a true working professional and have a degree where people will like let her practice what she's doing as a as a doctor like what if we give ourselves that same training that same eight to ten years to actually be somebody who like if somebody's going to let us put a patient on the table and perform surgery, like what if we treat screenwriting that way 
and writing. If somebody's going to pay us a lot of money to write a movie, they're going to trust that we can like perform heart surgery. So let's apply that same sort of principle of like, okay, it's not a sprint. It's going to be a marathon. And how do we give ourselves 10 years to try to make this work? Yeah, we literally wrote down our super cheesy Jerry Maguire mission statement when we were like 23 years old. Uh, and in it said something to the effect of like, this is a 10 year plan. Like we're committing to this for 10 years. And if after 10 years, it ain't happening for us, maybe it's because like, we're not meant to do it. We're not talented enough or, you know, we'll reassess. Um, but we went into it from the start with that framing in mind of not like, oh, we're just, we just like writing. So we'll just write when inspiration hits. No, we would sit down in the chair and inspiration would hit at some point in a, in an eight to 12 hour day or several times in an eight to 12 hour day, but not ever when you expected it and not, you know, just because you hoped and wished it would show up. We had to show up for it. Yeah, makes sense. I want to, I want to come back now to you um, working as teachers. So this is quite a unique, unique perspective that you've actually been teachers and are teaching students who are um, the age that are on this call or are going to be watching this video, what are the kind of things that, that you would teach your students or try to impart to them to help them become better writers in your classes? Uh, you want to feel that, Aaron? Sure. Um, I think on, the, on our pure creative or writing level is uh, specificity was one of our biggest lessons is, well, there's two. There, the, there's the general and then there's the specific. The general is and it's something it took us a long time to figure out, is this idea that nobody cares about anything uh, until you make them care. And that's got to start with yourself. So whatever it, and that doesn't have to be writing. It can be anything you're interested in or curious about is if you're going to convince somebody that you're the right person to do whatever it is that you want to do, whether it's play a sport or write or anything, uh, you have to care more than anybody else to the point that you care so much that you pour, you're so passionate, you pour so much into it that it becomes infectious and undeniable and everybody else can't help but see sort of like the illumination and halo effect that that has for yourself. It radiates out and ripples out to everyone else. And so when you're be specific, writing- about, Be specific about that, like rather than say, you know, Here's we, we're reading Catcher in the Rye now, or we're reading, you know, Merchant of Venice. What is the theme of this apply? And write me a five point essay about this. We'd say an assignment as teachers is like, what are you curious and interested about in this book we're reading or in this story? Or we'd give a different, if we had to like meet the curriculum of, of that class, we'd give that kind of assignment. Or we try to branch away from that entirely and say, why don't you write us a story or an essay or a poem or whatever medium you're interested in about some subject that you care about deeply, right? And those, uh, whatever is turned in, are going to, by default, right off the bat, be more interesting and better quality, quote unquote, because they'll match what Aaron just said, because you students listening to this, you're going to care about what you're writing about rather than trying to chameleon write something you think your teacher is going to like to give you a grade that you want, right? Like if you can forget all that and just, what am I curious about? And I'll learn something through the process of writing it. That's going to, that, that's going to be more meaningful and you'll remember it and it'll, it'll, it'll be better. Now you can do the specificity thing. Um, yeah, I mean, one, just to really be specific about our specificity lesson, like an easy one is we give people an object, like, I don't know, this has happens to be on my desk because my seven-year-old's really into magic. So like, here's a magic wand and you just, you would put it in the middle of the room and everybody would have to spend 10, 15 minutes to write anything they want. It could be a poem, a short story, a nonfiction, like reporting journalism thing, anything, they could draw a picture, whatever they want, but how do you describe the object, and it could be any object, whatever the object is that you choose, in a way that feels very specific using, you know, the five senses, like, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? What's the point of, you could write it from the point of view of the magic wand. What is the magic wand's point of view as a magician's using it? 
Um, is it a funny, is it a horror? Is it an action, you know, story? Like f- getting as specific and, and, and tangible so it feels like a real lived in object uh, is a way of drilling past what we find most writers, not just beginning starting writers or young writers, but like all writers, where you tend to start from a very general point of view of like, oh, it's black and it's got two metal ends. And, you know, you start from like a very boring kind of, but if you start to be like, you start to think from the point of view of a wand and suddenly you're setting- but even a... if it's Even if it's a midnight black cylinder with shimmering faux silver end caps, you start to see that more than just saying it's a black wand with two silver, two, you know, two silver ends. That doesn't tell you anything. That's just, it's just doesn't live. So how do you add more specific adjectives and adverbs and qualifiers to the thing to bring it to life? How do you see it? And then try to make, use word choices that communicate that to your audience. I can really see how you're looking at something from so many different angles at once. And it constantly is like a, a source of material that you can draw upon potentially for, for your work. It's very fascinating. And you, know, you often talk about specificity, also authenticity in uh, in your writing. I'm wondering if, you know, I know you've had quite, both of you, quite a, a broad breadth of experience. You've, you've lived in Japan. I think it was, I think it was Aaron that lived in Japan and also um, didn't, didn't you also travel, for instance, on the, the Hokulea, which is this large Polynesian um, transoceanic canoe that, that uses um, yeah, it's, it's traditional basically techniques? The end, of, the end of Moana, if you've seen it, like those giant yeah. voyaging canoes that they're on, that is inspired yeah. by the Hokulea, yeah. Yeah. Maybe you could talk about the, the experiences that you've had, this breadth of experience, and how you draw upon that in, uh, in your writing. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot about being creative or being artistic or even just being a human in the world is, and what we love so much about books, being like nerdy kids on the most remote island chain in the world, in the Pacific, with like not a lot of access to other cultures or other you know, perspectives or ethnicities. I mean, we're the melting pot. We have a lot of like, we're the in between East and West. So there, you know, Hawaii is the most diverse, uh, one of the most diverse places in the world, but you're not hearing stories necessarily from the African-American experience or the Indonesian experience or the, you know, and, and so to be able to read a book is a, is a transportation device into somebody else's experience and way of seeing the world, whether it's Star Wars and you're in some galaxy far, far away, or you're like Anne Frank living in World War II in an attic, um, there, there's different ways, there's 8 billion ways right now of living in the world. And, and so we were always fascinated by that ability. And so getting to part of being a, a writer is the more experiences you can have out in the world, out in life. It doesn't have to be traveling halfway across the world like we did studying abroad, Jordan in Italy, me in Spain, us together in Brazil, me in Japan after college for a couple months when my wife taught there, um, sailing on an ancient Polynesian voyaging canoe between Hawaiian islands. Like those are all ways of opening yourself and your experience to other ways of seeing the world and other ways people see the world and just you know, like one of my greatest experiences was being on Hokulea at 2 a.m. off the coast of Lanai, having sailed across one of the uh, most roughest channels in the world uh, and having night watch. And it was just me and one other crew member awake lying uh, on the kind of mesh spider webbing in between the two canoe holes with the ocean two feet below you just skimming by and two giant bottlenose dolphins uh, swimming crisscross in full moonlight with bioluminescent just like ghost dancing underneath you. And to be able to try to like imagine what it's like to be those dolphins at the same time as I'm above them watching it is like a way of moving outside of yourself and having a different experience. And that's a way of coming more alive, I think, as a, as a person and in the world. And that I think makes you be able to 
come alive more on the page or if you're painting or if you're singing or dancing or any kind of artistic endeavor. Mm -hmm. Great. I'd love to hear also about you know, th those nine years, your overnight success in nine years. You yeah. know, over over mm -hmm. that period, it, it must have had you know all, all kinds of setbacks. Um, you're you're working these these part time jobs, trying to you know make time for this this full time job to make it happen. How did you deal with the the pressure to succeed sooner, you know, social pressure, and you know the various setbacks you had? Tell tell, tell us a little bit about your your outlook and mental fortitude that you had to um, have to um, to overcome this obst these obstacles. Yeah, I mean, let me preface, that's a great question. Uh, and you will certainly, if you, if we may get ahead of ourselves for, for students at the start of exploring creativity as something that they could be interested in, right? And so I don't want you to feel like there's a danger in the question of that being creative has to lead to an outcome that the rest of the external world maybe starting with your families, your parents, your extended families, people outside of that in the world that you will come to meet, uh, deem a success because you make money from it or you can support yourself from it. You may never, I don't know. We may never have, we didn't really, we hoped we would. We hoped that we could continue to uh, do what we love, which was writing, but we were gonna do it anyway. If we had to teach, we were going to do it anyway. We just would have had to make more time to do it on top of what we did to pay the bills, to support ourselves and our growing families. Um, so you have to, if you really, really love it, and you don't know that yet at this age, you don't have to know that yet at this age, unless you do, uh, you do it not for the outcome, you do it for the process. You do it for the curiosity, the passion, the fulfillment that it gives you. And if you're doing it for that reason, then it's easy to fend off kind of the slings and arrows of outrageous expectation to change Shakespeare here uh, that will come on you. The noise, the sound and fury, if I'll steal another Shakespeare of the world, um, which will want you to... Uh, be successful. Like I said, and you said, uh, 10 years to become an overnight success. And those 10 years were lean. They were peanut butter sandwiches and, you know, just making enough to cover the rent. So we could write full time um, and, and working hard at it. And, and so, yeah, I, I don't think you, if you want to be creative and do that as your career path, you are choosing a harder path that doesn't have built-in stability. And if you're a person for any number of factors that are totally valid and valuable in your own life, who requires and needs or thrives in an environment that feels more stable, then find what brings you alive within a career that provides that kind of stability. Because the arts, what we love and why we do it is because we love throwing ourselves into the uncertain and the unknown. It's where we feel the most alive, but we're freaks of nature that way. I don't think that's normal for most of humankind. Most of humankind likes to feel certain and stable and safe, and we like to travel around the world, cliffs. have new experiences and, and, and do things that are not necessarily certain uh, because it's always new and fresh. It's always a challenge. We're always growing. We're trying to become uh, beginners again. Picasso has this great quote that uh, all children are born artists and the challenge is to, uh, to, to stay, stay artists as you become adults. And for us, that's doing things that we don't know how to do or if we'll be able to do that scare us because that's, that's what kids do all the time. And if that sounds terrifying to anyone listening to this talk, that's okay. Everyone's different, right? And 
find something that that you'll feel safer in. But if that sounds thrilling and exciting, then write or paint or dance or make music or draw or do things that are creative because they bring you alive and whatever comes from it, whatever success externally comes from it, that's bonus, that's secondary. Throughout these nine years, and to borrow another phrase from Shakespeare, in your heart of hearts, did you believe that you would be successful? You kind of just, you felt it? Was that something that you experienced? Curious to know. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. There, we had a naive confidence <laughs> um, that was probably uh, a the only positive byproduct of being, as you know, <laughs> teenage know-it-alls, uh, <laughs> our, our teachers and, and many of our peers were not big fans of us from like ninth grade to 11th grade because we were such arrogant know-it-alls until we thought we knew what the world was like until we started to see more of the world and and were humbled by it and, and, real, and got more grounded. Um, but we always had this sense of, and, and, and we're fortunate because we had very um, supportive family and parents who were artistic and never said you have to do one certain thing they said find what it is you're interested in and so we always had the sense of if if you're given the opportunity and not everybody is given the opportunity and certainly most people aren't given equal opportunities uh if you're given the opportunity to choose what you want to do with your life and you only have this one life to live then make sure you choose to do the thing that brings you alive uh, and be allow yourself the time and the patience and the silence and the quiet to listen to your own inner voice and not everybody else's voice to figure out what that is uh, because anything you choose or, or let other people choose for you is going to be hard. If you decide you wanna be a plumber for the rest of your life, it's just as hard fixing pipes as it is writing scripts. Like everything requires an equal amount of effort and output to be successful in. So choose the things that make you feel fulfilled within that success. Um, it would be my advice to my younger self. Um, fortunately, I gave that advice to my younger self because I was a know-it-all. <laughs> you know, I, or, I, or I hammered it into you. Yeah. Nice. One of the things you've talked about before um, in being a screenwriter is that effectively you're both entrepreneurs, actually. Could, could you talk a little bit about that and the, the parallels between screenwriting and entrepreneurship as you see it? Yeah, that's sort of the unfortunate uh, side job we had to learn when later we set out to just be artists and writers and along the way learned how to be businessmen as well, because at least I think it's probably true of most, most art, artistic uh, endeavors and, and professions, um, but certainly in Hollywood where screenwriting is, is as much a craft as it is an art and a screenplay is something that's, you probably have never read on this, uh, on this Zoom, because 99.9% of the population of the world has never and will never read a screenplay. We, I've are never writers, read we are writers for without an audience, right? And what a screenwriter really is, we're like the, we're the film version of architects, right? How many of you have seen blueprints? Probably few. You might have a sense of what they look like in your mind but you've seen a lot of houses, right? Everyone on this everyone on this has seen lots of movies, but you probably never read a screenplay. The screenplay becomes the blueprint for the movie that helps everyone else see what it's gonna be. And then all the contractors come in. The director is essentially the general contractor. And then he hires the subcontractors who are the heads of the camera, you know, the cinematographer, the head of makeup, the head of wardrobe, the actors, they all are craftspeople good at their specific jobs who help build the building or the house or the movie from the blueprints that we uh, write. And so to communicate your vision has to go beyond, we had to learn, just 
the writing part, we have to communicate it to all those people as well, because there's lots of money goes into making a movie, like making a building, lots of risk. And so uh, we're constantly having to pitch our story, pitch our vision, fight for what it is, protect that vision. You know, if a contractor, let's call him the director says, but I want to move this beam from here to over here structurally in the story. And we have to be there if they allow us to say, well, you can do that and it might aesthetically look better, but this whole section of the story is going to collapse. It's not going to make any sense. And so it's very similar in that way. And, uh, and that becomes a lot of the business side of it. Well, skills you need to be a professional screenwriter, not just you know, incredible writing skills, perseverance, but also being able to communicate and, and sell, sell your script um, as well. So you can't just focus on being the greatest writer of all time. You have to really have a whole quiver of high level skills. Unless yeah. you're the greatest writer of all time. Like there oh. are some unbelievable <laughs> on the spectrum, can't look people in the eye, have social dis, you know, disorders that make it very hard. They're hypochondriacs. They're famous, famous. Watch Charlie Kaufman give a speech when he wins the Oscar for any of the movies he's won an Oscar for. He, he did Being John Malkovich. He did Adaptation. He did Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Eternal Sunshine of the... He's one of the greatest living screenwriters, and he is an incredibly fidgety, neurotic, introverted, uncomfortable, socially awkward human being who happens to be one of the greatest screenwriters of all time. And it doesn't matter if you're that good um, because you're that good. You can communicate it on the page. Um, but for the rest of us mortals, it helps. It certainly helps to be able to be a little charismatic, a little able to well, pitch it. And I feel like I feel like this generation is already so far advanced from beyond ours. Uh, just like the for all of the evils of social media that everybody talks about, there are some benefits. Which is, I feel like you like you already know how to market yourself better because you're doing it every day online with your peers. Uh, and the and the larger world for good and bad, uh, you know, there's pros and cons to that. But you are more already, I think, educated in the ways of marketing and selling and branding and merchandising things in large in yourself uh, specifically. Right. So just a few. Quick questions to kind of get a better understanding of your personality and how you work. What does your average day look like right now working? Uh, we have little kids. And so we're pretty much like in the nine to five window of work just because that's when we can write. Back in the day, we could write when, you know, in a more flexible kind of art artist schedule. But now it's definitely like drop our kids off, work from eight till school pickup, which is like, you know, now it's like 2.30, 3.30, depending on the day. Um, and we're writing as much as we can in that window of time with breaks to answer emails, business calls, pitch meetings, things of that nature that like, as we said, is the business half that we also have to field, but uh, isn't what we love. And so the more time we can carve to focus, right? But we write every day, Maybe it's now, you know, six to eight hours at most, four to eight, depending on the day, but always it's between four and eight and usually four to six, I'd say. And what do you like most and least about your work? I think just the the pure process of putting words down on a page is what we love the most. Uh, it's the thing that uh, we've always loved. It's, you know, from reading starting in, you know, first grade. And as you saw, you would come over to our house and you would see that we had so many fan. We were obsessed with fantasy uh, from, I'd say, fourth grade to 10th grade. We had so many books. We would read like a book every one or two days that our bookshelf literally collapsed under the weight of all of the books. Uh, that it, it was insane. Uh, so it was a it was a love of language and a love of of reading and, and the the kind of alchemy and power and magic of words that then transferred into 
trying to capture that same feeling we get reading in how we write. Uh, so we love doing that, which, you know, you'd be shocked to hear how many professional working writers hate writing, find it torturous, and like, it's like going to the dentist and getting their teeth drilled. And to us, that never made sense to us, because like, if you're gonna write, or you're gonna choose such an instable career, like, hopefully you at least love the the actual writing part of it. Otherwise, the whole thing is just going to be torturous. Um, so yeah, we don't love the business side of it. We just love the like pure creative writing side of it. Mm -hmm. And what's the most difficult aspect of being screenwriters? Producer. Um, <laughs> producing, yeah, not writing. Because um, we also are producers now too. Mm -hmm. I think here's the hardest part. The hardest part, uh, which we'll call Zen in the art of uh, screenwriting, but I think it applies to anything, is surrendering control, which we've learned is just an illusion over the outcome of whatever we create. Because specifically in screenwriting, it takes hundreds of people to make a movie or a TV show. And we're just the start. We're the first, we're sort of, we control our world, we're the gods of the world first, but certainly not last. And once we hand it over to be kind of come into existence out off of the page, it changes. Every hand that touches it has a point of view, everything, it, it changes the vision. And that can make for even better storytelling and even better art as it did in Moana, and we watched that evolve in the most kind of amazing, beautiful way. Um, so there was nine, 900 people worked on Moana by the end of it. And each brought something, you know, we, we'd see an animator and they'd be like, here, check out, like, I've spent five years putting bubbles in the water. And then you go watch the bubbles in the movie next time you watch that in the water. And you're like, oh my God, that's the most realistic animated water I've ever seen because of the way the bubbles move. That was one person's job for like five years. And so that stuff makes it better. Uh, but we've also made things adrift where the thing changed in ways that weren't our vision and weren't uh, oops, what we were as proud of that we put on the page. And that's the most difficult part of the process is to watch, watch your vision kind of get corrupted a little bit. Still a good movie, but not what we wanted it to be. So let it, letting go of your baby after you've brought them to the world. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe stop seeing it as your baby and mm -hmm. as something uh, something that is meant for, for more a village to raise instead of a, you. And it's interesting because many of us may have only seen these, these two movies, but of course you, you've made many more and sold many more. So I, I think you've said before that, well, getting, getting a screenplay sold is like winning the lottery but then you need a second lottery to actually get it made. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. mission I, statement, that Jerry Maguire mission statement had three goals on it. The first one was to sell a screenplay. The second one was to get a screenplay turned into a movie. And the third one was to get a movie made that we're proud of. And we you know, succeeded in the first one within four years. We succeeded in the second one in like 12 years wow. and we six we're, you know we're always working on the third yeah yeah and really? and yeah we've, we've had two movies made out of probably 30 things we've uh written and that's considered like a successful batting average right <laughs> in the it, uh, uh, which is crazy and the thing we didn't know as screenwriters and it, it's good to know is like the amount of working professional screenwriters is equal to or even more limited than the amount of like professional athletes like to be a working screenwriter is like the equivalent of being like an nba or an nfl player yeah so absolutely. it requires the same kind of discipline and work ethic and there's a lot of working paid professional screenwriters who you know never start a game 
they're just part of the backup bench team, essentially. Like they'll never have a produced credit or they, there's some who make way more than we do who's, who've never had a movie come out, but they are constantly working and selling and rewriting scripts and, and in uh, the Hollywood system, but their stuff just hasn't been made yet because it's, it's very, it's like winning the lottery twice to get anything made. It's very, um, there's so many things that can throw a project off when it's on track to get made. Right. So I'm going to open it up for questions. So the audience, you can type into the chat and I'll ask one final question before we take a look at the questions that you have. And that is, um, how, yes, how do you, you can still come out sword fight with us. It's you're, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, I can still do that. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, how do you find creative inspiration besides sparring with each other out on your back lawn? Mm, good one. Uh, it certainly helps having a twin or if you don't have one cloning one, so then you can dialogue and talk back and forth. Um, it's, I think it's, a, as I said earlier, for us, like we let stories find us more than we actively seek stories. And that's just being like opening your mind and your heart to like the world around you and just kind of being a satellite dish and seeing what's coming in and bouncing off. Uh, and and then what's the things that, that bring you alive, which will be different for every single person on this, you know, this Zoom. Like for us, it's surfing, being in the ocean, hiking, reading. We always was reading, watching movies, watching great art that other people have put their their you know hearts and souls and passion and commitment and sweat into uh, is always inspiring to us. There's there's there could be a thousand, a million different ways that that we can find inspiration and, and you can too it just depends on on you really great um oh we got a question so what is the process of selling a pilot for a series to a network mm, complicated um the simple answer is uh write a pilot first we're doing this right now um, and we've done it in the past. Uh, so you'll write either, depends on your format, a 30 minute, if it's like a 30 minute show, a sitcom, a comedy or something supposed to be 30 minutes or an hour long, probably more of a drama or thriller, murder mystery or something like that, that fits an hour format. You usually write it first uh, and then you try to sell it. You can take it out as a called naked script where it's just, here's the work and does it move you? And if you have a, a team of representatives, which is a whole nother conversation and question and step that you try to get first, you might go in this stage. Like if you're at ground zero and you've never sold anything, you've no representation, you're trying to get a manager or an agent or an attorney or some combination of those three who you get your script, and this applies for film too, into the hands of, and find somebody who loves it, who loves your voice, who wants to represent you, who thinks they can sell it, who's going to take it out into the world. And then they kind of get deputized to be your representative and to help you sell it. So they'll then send it to producers. Maybe they'll send it to actors. Maybe they'll send it to filmmakers. Try to get different elements and interest and generate a little smoke that your reps are glowing, trying to get heat in the marketplace and eventually or straight away if it's just a naked script as i said take two buyers and that'll be whoever the distributor platform is so if it's going to be a traditional network like nbc fox kind of a place or now most of them are streamers like disney plus and apple tv and netflix and so forth amazon um you'll take it to those executives and those buyers and see if anyone loves it and wants to buy it. Sometimes you have to pitch, not just send the script, but you might go and pitch, here's my show, here's uh, here's what the story it is, and then here's where it's going to go beyond the pilot for the rest of the arc of the whole season and what's going to happen. So they have confidence that you know what your story is beyond just like that first episode. Uh, and then hopefully somebody buys it. That's the most like 10,000 foot view, bigger answer to your question. But each of those stages comes with many factors, complications, and things that like you kind of have to hit every branch on the tree to learn your first time or three. 
Thank you for that answer. And thank you, Gigi, for the question. Eric asks, how did y'all take on rejection and how did that help build your career? Or how did you make that build your career? Um, rejection is comes with the territory. It's probably the most constant and sharpest weapon that gets jabbed in our direction uh, as writers uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. And you have to very quickly develop both like thick skin armor to it. Um, and I mean, it's something we still deal with all the time. Uh, and for us, um, I'll give you a, I'll give you a metaphor that became very helpful to us uh, that we saw, I think senior year in high school, the Dalai Lama came and visited Hawaii uh, and he brought with him some Tibetan monks, Buddhist monks, who they do this thing, and you can you can look it up, and it's really amazing. Uh, they make these sand mandalas out of individual grains of colored sand, but they blow through straws individual pieces of sand to make a a living artistic representation of a mandala, which is the highest form of spiritual enlightenment and nirvana in the religion of Tibetan Buddhism. And it takes them weeks to months, depending on the size and scale of the mandala they're making, uh, to make this. And the whole time they're doing each grain of sand, they're doing an internal chant. And it's the practice of trying to make the best artistic representation of fulfillment for them. Uh, and when they finish, it's this beautiful work of art that they spend an hour, maybe two, letting the public see, and they do some prayers and chants over. And then they intentionally sweep it all away into a jar that they either then pour into a stream or release into the air so that the colors of the mandala can mix with the greater colors of the world. And it's an exercise in detachment because if you're not willing to detach yourself from the things that are important and meaningful and matter to you, the winds of fate and chance will take it away for you regardless. So, that was, we always thought, a beautiful metaphor for approaching our writing, which is we have to just love the daily meditation and process of putting individual words as best as we can on the page, like those individual grains of sand, because that is what's bringing us the fulfillment and like the, the, the spiritual wholeness and that the final product that of course we would love to mix with the greater uh, colors of the world, but we can't control if they will or not. And they might just get swallowed into this giant sea of content that exists all the time, or it may never even get made and may not make it out into sea. So we just have to be ready to let it go as soon as we've finished it. And so that's a way of not only dealing with, uh, rejection when it comes directly at you, but preparing yourself uh, internally for any external rejection, even your own internal rejection of your abilities is just, did I enjoy making this thing? Was it meaningful to me? Did I care about it first and foremost? And if, it, if that is true, then if it makes it to anybody else, that's bonus, then it may never, and that's okay. That's a beautiful analogy, and I'm tempted to end the interview right there on that. But uh, Coco has one more question. It'll be our final question. I really enjoyed the energy of this meeting. Well, thank you, Coco. To me, Aaron is magic, and Jordan is logic. You complement each other. And she asks, do either of you offer internships or some mentor mentorship opportunities like you did you know, five and 10 years ago as, uh, as teachers currently? Yeah, we, we have had interns prior to COVID. It sort of slowed that to, to not happening, but uh, I, we'd, probably be, we'd probably entertain the concept again now that COVID has sort of passed us. Um, yeah. I mean, the so, caveat yeah. of interning with writers is it's not all that interesting, right? You're largely watching us write. There's not a <laughs> lot 
uh, to, to yeah, see. You kind of become more of like a research assistant if it's a true story of like, read this nonfiction book and tell us what you think is interesting in it. So it may it may not be the experience you fantasize about, but so so know that before you, you truly pursue. But um, yeah, you, my first, my first, my first internship in college uh, was at like a pretty high level production company in LA. And I couldn't make it more than six weeks doing it because I they just had me sitting in a room reading, you know, six to 10 screenplays a day and fetching people coffee. And it didn't feel like the f like what I was looking for uh, in terms of uh, like reading the scripts was great, but you can do that now. At the time, you couldn't find scripts on the internet. Now you can do it from the comfort of your own home and you don't need people telling you what to do or, or um, how much cream they want in their coffee. Yeah, the best uh, mentorship we can give rather than like a one-on-one -on -one internship, but if you're so determined, please follow up, is um, write more, a lot, and like fail and rewrite what you wrote that you thought was so amazing, put it in a drawer and then read it again two weeks or a month later and rewrite it because you'll make it better with some objective distance and then just keep writing. And if you do that, like uh, that's how you'll learn. You'll learn that more than any class or, or any teacher, really.